Hello, welcome to Connie Martin's and Talks Books. My guest today, I am sure when she was born, there was somebody over her that said, may you live in interesting times, because this is a full, over 300 page book, and she is still a young woman. And I think that could have been one of those people who said, may you live in interesting times. But her book is called Timeless, Love, Morgenthau, and Me. It's published by Fire Strauss Giroux. And welcome, Lucinda Franks. Thank you so much, Connie. And I'm not joking. You had to have somebody saying, may you live in interesting times. Indeed. I, I spanned some interesting times. Yes, you do. Beginning the, the 60s, then uh, dating various people and marching. And uh, then you're told you've been writing and you get a Pulitzer Prize for your first book about your father, which was called? My Father's Secret War. And now you're living in New York and someone says, listen, here at the New York Times, we want an article on a man named Robert Morgenthau, who is the district attorney of New York State or city. Right. Follow me up. Well, it was a very odd experience to interview Bob Morgenthau. I mean, he was world famous. Uh, I was, you know, in my 20s, he was an old man of 50 something. And uh, I just thought he was the strangest looking person. He had this big forehead and, uh, you know, this commanding voice. Uh, and he later said he thought I was either the dumbest or the smartest reporter that he had ever met because I asked so many detailed questions. Later, he decided it, I wasn't the dumbest, and he pursued me. Uh, unfortunately, these were the 70s, and I was harboring a drafter sister who never told me that Bob had called. Uh, finally, <laughs> Bob got me a job on the, I was actually at UPI when this happened, uh, got me a job at the New York Times just so he could uh, reach me on the telephone. Mm -hmm. So he reached me on the telephone and the rest is history. It's in the book. <laughs> it's in the book. All right, but let's get to the fact too that uh, having met him, who was the Morgenthau family, that name was like Roosevelt, and they were close friends. Yes, yes, they lived not too far from each other. Uh, they became fast friends, and uh, Franklin uh, helped uh, Henry, Henry Morgenthau, Bob's father, uh, into higher uh, realms of politics, and he ended up being FDR's Secretary of the Treasury. And yep. nobody knows this, really, but, uh, or a few people know it, but he was responsible for rearming the United States in preparation for the war. We would not have won the yep. war had it not been for Henry Morgenthau. And his father had been with, uh, with uh, Wilson. He had been w uh, Woodrow Wilson's ambassador to Turkey when the Turk, uh, Turks uh, committed genocide uh, on the Armenians, Henry Morgenthau I cry, you know, put up a hue and cry about it and wouldn't stop until finally he was fired and he was brought back to the United States and the genocide finally stopped. Now you are this hot running gal in her 20s, meeting Bob Morgenthau, a widower. His wife had died of cancer, and he's got, what, four, five? Five. Five kids who are, some in college, some out, and a young, young one who was in her teens. Yes, it, it was a, a big challenge. Uh, we we uh, dated for a while until we we realized we were caught. Sometimes you certainly do not plan 
to uh, fall in love with the kind of people you fall in love with. And uh, we, we just couldn't stay apart. Uh, even though he was 30 years older, I was anti-establishment, he was establishment. Uh, people were so shocked when we announced our engagement that it was like uh, the Pope had asked Squeaky Frome for her hand in marriage. All right. Do me a favor and let our friends in the audience hear some of the writing in this book. It is more than just history. Well, you, cho <laughs> you chose one of the, uh, the more interesting parts. So tell me about your past, your sex life, I said, as we were walking over the rough cobblestone stones of Soho. I cringed. No, it hadn't seemed the right thing to say just after I'd said it. Was I testing him, seeing if he would give up his sense of delicacy in order to get with my way of being? The question was simmering. I felt compelled, driven, even to ask it. He was, of course, taken aback. I probably was too blunt. But how else would I have brought up the subject, which, after several months together, we bloody well should have shared before. And after he, who on a first date that I didn't even know was a date, had almost pushed down my door to get at me, hadn't I waited long enough to find out who else had been the object of his rabid appetites? I mean, Bob, let's start with how many people you've slept with. He gave me a wintry look. It's a perfectly legitimate question, Bob, at the times, I was told, you had bedroom eyes. I smiled encouragingly. Pure rumor, he replied, laughing. I've also heard you've gone through women like wine. He gazed up at the buildings. Look at this architecture, he said, the November winds almost blowing off his tweed cap, surely a relic from some ancestor. Every building different, he said, gargoyles, mansard roofs, Gables, pillars. Incidentally, these cobblestones are really Belgian block. They, I squeezed his hand. Bob, we've shared everything else. Why won't you answer me about sex? And <laughs> let me just hold up some of the pictures of you and Bob. Um, and let's start with, here's the gentleman in the corner. Handsome picture, graduate of Amherst. And then we went on to Yale Law School. Uh-huh. Uh, and in that other picture, uh, he was, he, in that picture, he was, I would say, 24. In the picture that's next to it of, of me, uh, I'm a debutante uh, of 18. And the next thing I know, we're standing below those pictures on Mount Sinai uh -huh. uh, in Israel, visiting Israel, and climbing up the, this rather treacherous mountain. You now get on what I would call the uh, chicken dinner. You are with him while he is running for office. You are there for when he gives speeches. Different world for you. Yes. It was a different world, and, you know, at first I rebelled. I didn't want to wear pumps and, you know, fancy dresses and get my hair coiffed like a beehive. I, I, I really didn't want to, and he said, go as you feel like you want to. So I dressed in my hippie clothes. In fact, one day he took me to Arthur Schlesinger's home to uh, meet Jimmy Carter, and I walked in, and it was a ghastly fairyland of satin and sequins and feather boas coiled around swan-thin necks. There were society ladies who looked at me like I was homeless. However, I was saved by Jackie Kennedy Onassis, who followed me in, and all the society ladies dropped their jaws and smiled dumbly at her because she hadn't been seen for a long time. I looked up at Bob, and he was smiling too, but not at Jackie. Yeah. And I had been wearing platform shoes, uh, bell bottoms, 
peasant blouse, uh, you know, he still loved me. Yeah. Maybe that was why you stayed true to you. And yet here he is, I mean, it's amazing, with the, the farm out in the, the suburbs, the whole so the whole book in that picture, and including not being that far from the uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt estate, because their mothers were friends. Yes, and they yeah. rode together all the time. In fact, there's a uh, picture on our wall of the two of them riding close together, and their horses were airbrushed in the photo, to look exactly alike. So they were very, very close. And I think this friendship uh, was, you know, so intimate that it brought together the two men, Franklin and, and Henry. And also the fact this was not a world that had Jewish and Gentile people of even our crowd mixing that much. It was not that an assimilated crowd. Yes, indeed. Uh, I think that the Roosevelts had only, at that point, early in his career, uh, Franklin Roosevelt had only one Jewish friend, and that was Henry Morgenthau. Yeah. Uh, and of course he went on to have uh, Jews in his cabinet, but not very many. Uh, so it was a, it was a uh, a total, you know, shock to the people that were all around them. Now, I do know that Eleanor Roosevelt was really a marvelous friend to a man named Varian Fry, who was in France helping Jews of uh, really fabulous people escape mm -hmm. and escape from the Nazis. Right. But uh, that's a whole other book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyhow, there you are back in that era. And you, tell me about being the stepmother to a girl named Barbara. Well, I loved Barbara. She was 13 years old. Uh, the older girls were my age, and that was much more of a problem because, you know, who wants their father to marry someone their own age? Uh, you know, I had stepped into not only their mother's place, even though she had died five years before, I had also stepped into their place. Uh, but Barbara and I got along very well, maybe because I was very close to being a teenager at that point in my early 20s. And so I could understand what she was going through as a 13-year-old. And I tried to be careful to give her time with her father, which is what she needed. Yeah. Uh, you two, with Bob, go through some rough periods. He has uh, cancer on his nose, and then you develop breast cancer. And I do understand having known people where husbands did not take the wives to the hospital or pick them up. You went through that, and still the marriage survived. Ah, uh, yes. It, we, it, they were, it was really challenging time because we were both afraid for our lives, even though both of us recovered and it's been 20 years uh, since, you know, our, our operations and we, we came down with it exactly, almost exactly at the same time. He melanoma me, a uh, uh, lump, lumpectomy. Uh, and we always were uh, used to reassuring each other that everything was going to be all right. And this time, Bob was not sure it was going to be all right. His first wife had died of breast cancer, and he was very much afraid, almost even convinced, mm -hmm. that I was going to die too. How did the children handle, because we should say two gorgeous children are in the family? Jo these are uh, children that Bob and I had together. Josh, who's 30 now, and Amy, who's 24. They're terrific kids. They yeah. were very young at the time, and we tried to shield them, but they knew something kids was know. going around. Yeah. Yes, they knew. Yeah. Um, 
years pass, marriages go through different stages, as we all know, and you both decide Portugal. Portugal. You had never been there, and Bob was not that young. He was 90 years old. I, as I am wont to do, was looking back at the past, uh, reminiscing nostalgically and a little unhappily that we would never take this trip or that trip again. And all of a sudden, we were in the Garden of Stones in the Holocaust Museum that he had founded, and it was very romantic. And he said, uh, I think you better pack your bags. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we're going to Portugal. And I thought, oh my God, I mean, there are what hospitals, what doctors, you know, what does Portugal have to safeguard his, his health, which was perfect. And, you know, we, we ended up not only having a wonderful time, it was a way of reinventing, renewing our marriage. And this was because we had a driver named Frankie, and Frankie thought Bob was the greatest thing. He had him walking faster than he's ever walked down the towpath. He thought I was fabulous. He was a photographer, and he was taking pictures of me all the time, everywhere I was, even when I, you know, crushed my finger in the elevator. He had the snapshot of it. Uh, so Bob, looking at how Frankie looked at me, remembered how he looked at me when he first fought, fell in love. And so he fell in love with me all over again. And the same was true yeah. with me, with Bob. And you had also just been through a very rough election. I mean, for the first time, the New York Times did not endorse Bob. Yes, yes. And that had to, I mean, after all, the people running the Times were his friends, his childhood friends, the Salzburgers. What do you mean they're not endorsing you? Yeah. It was one of the worst days in, I think, our lives together. Uh, it was like your, your mother renouncing you. Uh, I tried to hide the paper from Bob, <laughs> and then I thought that was ridiculous. Yeah. So I let him see it, and he said, damn, what is this all about? And they had decided, uh, the head of the Times had decided that uh, the paper needed um, a shot of new blood, and that there was a younger woman who of 60 who uh, was running, and Bob was in his 80s, and uh, they decided, she was a judge, uh, they decided they ought to try to do things differently. And so Bob was one of the first casualties. Well, he, he proved it. He, he was reelected. He was yeah. reelected yeah. by two thirds of the vote, in spite of the Times, yeah. you know, lack of endorsement, which is amazing. How many elections did you were you involved in once you were married? All of them, really. Uh, what is what is the time of the term? Every four years. Every four years. And uh, so many times. Uh, there was nobody who wanted to run against him. Uh -huh. It was just a slam dunk. But there were a couple, three times when, you know, uh, particularly African Americans who mm. wanted to get that spot in the government yeah. and didn't approve of the ways that Bob was handling uh, police killings of, uh, of African American men, uh, they ran against him and you know, were really vitriolic. Uh, and I was going around subway stops, carrying the baby, it was Josh, and uh, I was saying, let me tell you about Bob Morgenthau. I ought to know, I'm married to him. And so I had people surrounding me, you know, asking all sorts of questions, and it was a way to humanize him. Mm -hmm. And I think I got, you know, some voters yeah. Uh, but it was it was fun, but it was exhausting. Yeah. 
the other one was where you suddenly decide to go out and help. Yes, yes. I uh, just had a newborn baby, and I was, uh, I had been through one election, and I didn't want to be involved in this one, at least at first. Uh, I went to Martha's Vineyard, where we had a home, and I kept reading about him in the paper, and I read about how he was had a humiliating uh, reception at an African-American club, and I thought, what am I doing here? So I got the first ferry and drove back to New York and s apologized profusely and said, I know it must have been hard for you to be without me. And he said, you don't know how it's been. And I felt so yeah. awful. And boy, did I work yeah. very, very hard. Did you ever have a catered cocktail party again? When he would say, how could you spend this sort of money? Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> yes, no, no, I never did. This was when we were first married. And uh, I didn't know anything about cocktail parties or anything about his life. And so I'd gotten Dean and DeLuca, who were just starting out then, to uh, provide the hors d'oeuvres. And I was too shy to ask them How what much? it would cost. <laughs> yeah. And when the bill of $750, which was much more back then, uh, came in, he just went ballistic because he thought I was going to be a woman that would go through his money like water. And so did his kids at that point. Yes, yes. So and I had to d disprove this. I love the picture at the bottom. Yeah. What was the story there? Uh, you know, my son took that picture and we were just having a moment. We thought alone and my son was, you know, on the other side of the railing and cl clicked it. And, you know, we realized we'd been married for decades and we still loved each other passionately. Yeah. And we were very grateful for that. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And uh, what's the next holiday going to be? Where are you going on the ah, next trip? Well... Uh, we are talking about a, a trip maybe to uh, France. We've been to France a lot, mm -hmm. to Provence, when the lavender is out. And uh, I, think, I think we'll go there, and we'll probably have another Frankie who will drive us yeah. around, make sure, you know, we get medical help if we need it. Bob will be 96, uh, you know, when we take this trip. But... I have every confidence that it will go beautifully. I'm curious only about one thing. You did talk at first about taking your daughter to church, and then you let it go. And I wondered, now, did she have her son, Bar Mitzvah? I mean, how no. have you worked that out? Well, there's a long tradition in Bob's family and in many families of so-called our crowd, uh, the assimilated Jews that came over in the late 19th century, of trying to fit in with the populace, with the Christians, with the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he never was bar mitzvahed. Josh wasn't bar mitzvahed. Uh, we observe the high holidays. Mm -hmm. I hold a Seder. Uh, and... <laughs> Uh, the church thing with, with Amy, because I wanted her to know what my religion was when I grew up, mm -hmm. uh, was um, very sweet, and she became very attached to Jesus. And then one day, uh, she said, God doesn't exist. God is in the stones and the trees and the grass but he is not some man up there controlling us. And I thought, well, yeah. she's thinking for herself. Yeah. I wonder where that came from. I think in school, uh, she probably began talking about Christianity and about the hymn she sang with me. And uh, 
people said, look, you know, there is no God, and uh, this, is, this is how it is. Yeah. Either that or she read something. Meanwhile, will you sign my book? Absolutely. And if you'd like to know what else we've been reading, visit me on the web at www.connymartinson. Visit us on the, at YouTube, and you'll see this show again or recommend it to a friend. But whatever you do, Support your local library. It needs all the help you can give it, and it is the finest democratic institution in America. Who took you to the library the first time? My father. Yeah. When I was about five years old. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.